Let's pray as we come to read from God's holy word in the Bible. Lord God, bless my words this morning. May they come from you. May they be of you. May they bring glory to you. And I pray you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit during this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage this morning is one of those rare miracles of Jesus Christ that is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all thought that this miracle that we're about to read about was absolutely crucial to their telling of the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. And the reason all four of the Gospel writers wanted to include this miracle, thought it was a very significant story, is because it's a miracle full of meaning to reveal who Jesus is. This morning, as we read, we're going to learn that Jesus is a compassionate king. We're going to see that he is full of of power. We're going to see that he's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and stories. And we're going to see that Jesus Christ is one who provides for his people in a costly way. Let's read together this famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. I'm going to read Matthew 14 verses 13 to 21. Matthew 14 verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there, which is Nazareth, in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The story I've just read to you is not just a nice story, but it is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And that's going to be my focus this morning. This is a sermon all about who Jesus is. But before we we get to my main points this morning, there are also lots of application in this text. There's lots of ways you can read that text and apply it to our lives today to teach us how we should live as Christians. And I don't want to miss that out. So what I'm going to do is a quick fire application of the text, four ways in which this text challenges us as Christians and the way we live live our lives. And then I'm going to slow down to focus on how this text reveals who Jesus really is. If you're not a Christian and you want to know what who Christians believe Jesus is, then this is a sermon for you. And if you're a Christian and you want some application for your life this morning, and you want a reminder of the glorious power and love of Jesus Christ, then this is a sermon for you. So four quick fire applications of this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. Firstly, consider the crowd who left the comfort of their own homes in order to follow Jesus into this desolate place, into the wilderness. There's a hunger expressed by this crowd. 
They're forsaking the comfort of their own towns and villages where there's plenty of food in order to be with Jesus in the desolate place. While Jesus takes a boat, they walk round, they go the long way round in order to be with him. And if you remember, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told parables to this effect. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure and a man who sells everything he has in order to have this treasure. Jesus is the treasure that we should desire above everything else. We should be prepared to give up everything in order to have Jesus. And now we have a crowd who are, in some ways, living that out. Leaving behind comforts, leaving behind the other things they have in order to be with Jesus in this desolate place. And so that's a challenge, isn't it? That's a challenge to us. Are we living with that same hunger that these crowds demonstrate? What have you forsaken in order to follow Jesus Christ? Are you hungry to follow Christ in such a way that you'd leave your comfort zone? You'd leave what's comfortable in order to be in a desolate, uncomfortable place, but you're following Christ, so it's the right thing to do. And here's the big one. Is there something in your life that you need to give up, that you need to leave behind, that you need to forsake in order to follow Jesus Christ more closely and more fully? There are many distractions in life. There are many things that we devote time and energy to that are not of God. Do we need to give those things up in order to be more radical and more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ? That's my first challenge. My second challenge comes from verse 16. This is what Jesus says to the disciples in verse 16. You don't need to send the crowd away to go and buy their own food. You feed them. The you in the Greek is actually emphatic. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. You. The you is emphatic. There's an expectation. Jesus has an expectation that his disciples would feed the hungry. And I think that is that same expectation today. It would be foolish, wouldn't it, for us to read a story about Jesus showing such amazing compassion to a group of people, such that he feeds those who are hungry. It would be foolish of us to read that story and not to be challenged by that, to think, well, are we compassionate like that? Do we care enough for people who are hungry in order to feed them ourselves? Are we Christ-like in having that compassion for those who are hungry? Locally, there's a food bank in Fairham. Are you compassionate on the hungry to offer up your time to go volunteer at the Fairham food bank? Of course, we don't just live in a local community. We also live in a global community now. And there's plenty of people around the world who are starving, who are in a very bad place because of a lack of food. Does that bother you? Do you feel pity? Do you feel compassion when you hear these news stories? Can you be generous to do something about it and to feed the hungry around the world? That's the challenge here, isn't it, surely? A story about Jesus' compassion to feed the hungry surely prompts us as well to be compassionate, to be Jesus' disciples who do feed those who are hungry. The third challenge comes from verse 17. So Jesus says, you guys, you feed them, you give them something to eat, but the disciples don't respond in faith, do they? They rather, they focus on what they lack, what they don't have. Uh, Jesus, how are we going to feed these people? We've only got five loaves of bread and two fish. They could have said, Jesus, we have five loaves and two fish. What can we do with that? Or, Or can you add what we're lacking? You know, that would have been a really faithful response. But the response they actually bring is is one of focusing on what they don't have. Now, here's the challenge. I think as Christians, we can often do exactly what the disciples do in this passage. We feel a conviction to do something by the Holy Spirit. Maybe we're listening to a sermon and the preacher says, you need to feed the hungry, as a random example plucked out of nowhere. And you feel a conviction by the Holy Spirit. I need to act on that. I need to be a faithful disciple. Or you're reading the Bible and you, and you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. You feel God speaking to you about something in particular from God's word. I need to act on that. I need to do something about it. But then, instead of having faith, we start to focus on our lack of ability or our lack of resources 
or our lack of authority or position. You know, I don't have this power. I don't have these resources. How can I do anything about that? And so we persuade ourselves that we can't respond to the conviction that the Holy Spirit's put on our hearts. Have you ever done that? Have you ever read something in the Bible or been convicted of something and, and, and gone, yes, I'm resolved to do something, and then over time you persuade yourself that actually you're incapable of doing anything about it, and therefore you don't act. You don't move on the way God has been speaking to you. Christian disciples shouldn't focus on what they lack. Rather, they should focus on the one who prompts. If Jesus has asked you to do something, if the Holy Spirit has convicted you to take action, then surely the God who asks will also be the God who provides. If Jesus says to the disciples, you feed them, there's got to be a way for this to happen. That's what should have gone through the disciples' mind. If Jesus is asking us to feed them, then he, he must know something we don't know. And so the challenge is, just start with what you have from this passage. The disciples brought what they had, and Jesus did something amazing. And, and we as Christians are to do the same. Start with what we have, have faith that God will help us achieve what he wants. To follow through on convictions from the Holy Spirit. To follow through on prompts and asks from Jesus Christ, believing that he has power to provide what we need. There's a fourth and final challenge and application from verse 19. Jesus blesses the food that he's been given by the disciples. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us much about the mechanics of this miracle. When was it that the food started multiplying? Was it when Jesus blessed the food? Was it in the disciples' hand as they started handing out? Was it like they took a piece of bread out of a basket, gave it to someone, and then there was more bread back in the basket when they turned it? I don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us how the miracle really took place. But it does feel like the blessing of Jesus was significant. He takes the five loaves and the two fish and he blesses the food. Rachel and I will pray with thanksgiving before every meal that we eat together. It's a simple thing. It's often a short prayer, but it's a significant moment of acknowledging what we have and what we eat comes not first and foremost from the supermarket, but comes first and foremost from God. He is the one who provides. And so we, we, we thank God for the food, we bless the food. And that's something significant that we've built into our daily routine, our daily lives. And I think it is significant that Jesus, not just on this occasion, but on several occasions in his life, blesses the food. He thanks God and he prays for the food that he's about to share or that he's about to eat. Maybe that's something that we need to build into our lives, to express thankfulness, to acknowledge what God has done for us. So four ways this passage applies and changes the way we should live as Christians. Four ways that challenge us this morning. To leave what is comfortable to forsake and leave behind comforts in order to follow Jesus more, help, uh, more closely. To feed the hungry, because that's what Jesus' disciples should do. To respond in faith and focus on Jesus' power to provide for us rather than the things we lack. And to bless our food, to say grace, to say thanks to God for the things that he gives to us. But... If we focus on those challenges and those applications when we read this passage, we do the passage a disservice. In fact, we do Jesus a disservice. Those applications, those challenges are important and are from the Bible, but they are not the main point of this passage. This is probably true of every Bible passage, actually. We are very quick to read the Bible and to think, how does this affect me? What does this do for me? When in reality, the vast majority of the Bible is a story about God, is a story about Jesus and who Jesus is. And it's definitely true of this story. This story is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And so I want to spend the rest of my time this morning focusing on how this story, how this miracle feeding 5,000 men as well as women and children reveal the identity 
of Jesus Christ. And just as I had four applications, four challenges, I have four ways this story reveals who Jesus is. Firstly, Jesus is shown to be a compassionate king. Have a look at verse 14. Jesus has withdrawn to a desolate place, but the crowds follow him. Introverts take note of this. Jesus' compassion for the crowds trumps his desire for solitude. Extroverts, you guys need to look um, to verse 23, which comes after this story, where Jesus does eventually withdraw. He climbs a mountain and he goes up to a mountain by himself to pray. And so there's this, this wonderful pattern shown here by Jesus. Um, you know, I said I'm moving on to revealing who Jesus is, but there is this, this application here. There's this pattern shown to us by Jesus. He is one who seeks time alone to pray, to be with God his Father alone. And we must have a secret prayer life where we enter into God's presence alone. But he's also one who lets his compassion for others trump his need for solitude. That's what he demonstrates in this story. The crowds follow him and he goes, I have compassion on the crowd. And this is what it says in verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus is a compassionate king. This point is worth repeating over and over, week after week. We want to speak, we want to proclaim, we want to sing about the compassion of Jesus Christ. Jesus cares for people. He cares about us. He cares about you and he cares about me. The heart of Christ is love for people. That's what this story shows, isn't it? The crowds follow him and he has compassion on them and heals the sick. Every single one of us longs to be loved completely, utterly, and unfailingly. That's what each of us desire, to be loved in an unfailing way. That desire can only be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Friends, family, spouses, fathers, mothers, children, all will fall, fall short of lovingly, loving you unfailingly. They will all let you down at times. They will all make mistakes. But the heart of Christ is always and unerringly compassionate towards his people. Isn't that just an amazing thought? Jesus' heart is always compassionate towards you. Always. If you're a Christian, he will always eternally love you. Whenever you come to him, he will pour out love and compassion to you. This is demonstrated again in verse 16. Jesus doesn't send the crowd away to buy their own food. Rather, he invites them to sit. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to care for you. Jesus is revealed so clearly here to be the compassionate king. Jesus is the compassionate king. Secondly, Jesus is revealed to be salvation. Or more technically, Jesus is revealed in this story to be the greater Elisha. My second and third points from the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men as well as women and children, my second and third points this morning rely on Old Testament knowledge that is alluded to in Matthew's account of this miracle. And that Old Testament context, that additional context, helps us appreciate the magnitude and the significance of this miracle. And so the first Old Testament context that this passage needs is a story about Elisha the prophet. Elisha was a great prophet who was the prophet who came after Elijah. Elijah in the Old Testament, this great prophet, and his kind of the prophet who takes over from him is a prophet called Elisha. And this is a story from uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 to 44. Let me read this to you, a story about Elisha. Uh, 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. A man came 
from Baal Shalishah, bringing the man of God, that's Elisha, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So Elisha repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. The similarities between that story about Elisha and Jesus feeding the 5,000 are obvious, aren't they? There's a shortfall of food. In the Elisha story, they've got 20 loaves of barley and some grain, but they have a hundred men to feed. There's not enough food. And Elisha's servant's like, well, I can't possibly serve them this. Imagine, you know, when we're able to, we invited a whole load of you over for dinner. You know, the whole church over for dinner, and there was just a few small platefuls of food. It would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? And it's, well, that's what Elisha's servant's saying. There's not enough food. I can't set this before the men. And yet Elisha says, set the, give them the food. There will be enough, and there will be some left over. And that's exactly what happens. It's exactly what happens in this feeding of the 5,000 in, in Matthew chapter 14, isn't it? Except that Jesus' miracle blows Elisha's miracle out of the water. You know, Elisha had 20 loaves of barley and only 100 men to feed. Jesus had five loaves of bread and 5,000 men, as well as the women and children to feed. Jesus is shown here to be greater than Elisha. There's a miracle in the Old Testament, which is amazing, that God can feed 100 people with just a small amount of food. But there's a miracle in the New Testament, a miracle of Jesus Christ, which is far, far greater, because Jesus is greater than Elisha. Now also consider this, Elisha was the prophet who came after Elijah and Elisha saw Elijah taken into heaven and because Elisha saw Elijah taken into heaven in a chariot, Elisha is given a double portion of Elijah's spirit and the way that's shown in the Bible is that Elisha does twice as many miracles as Elijah. So Elijah's this amazing prophet. He does amazing miracles, amazing things. Elisha's said to have a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and he does twice as many miracles as Elijah. You can read the book of Two Kings, and you can count it up, and you can see that comparison. Now, isn't it interesting that last week we read a story where Herod kills John the Baptist and then thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist risen from the dead. It's almost as if Herod thinks that Jesus has John the Baptist's spirit, and that's why Jesus is able to do amazing miracles. Now John, of course, throughout the Bible, is called the second Elijah, who prepares the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? So you've got the story of John the Baptist, who's kind of the equivalent of Elijah, who, who dies, and Herod thinks that his spirit has in some way resurrected into Jesus Christ. And then you have this miracle that clearly references a miracle of Elisha. It's clear that Matthew is weaving this story together in order to show us that Jesus is the new Elisha, the true Elisha, the greater Elisha. In multiple ways, Matthew is referencing the Old Testament story of Elijah and Elisha to show us that Jesus is the greater Elisha. The question is, why is that important? Why is that meaningful? Well, firstly, it gives us a clue. It teaches us how to read the Old Testament. All the stories about Elisha ultimately point to Jesus who is greater. If you read two kings and you read the miracles Elisha does as a prophet, you're thinking, wow, this is amazing. This guy was phenomenal. But really, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be reading those stories and going, well, Elisha is amazing. God has blessed him with such amazing power. Jesus is greater than Elijah, isn't it? Elisha, isn't it great that I worship Jesus who is greater than this man? And so you read the Old Testament and all of it's pointing to Jesus and bringing glory to Jesus Christ. 
that's how to read the Old Testament, is to, to see how it points to and alludes to and leads to Jesus, who is the awesome saviour that comes in the New Testament. You know, I have the privilege of studying the Old Testament, uh, actually studying the whole Bible and teaching the Bible on a regular basis, not just on a Sunday, but throughout the week as well. I have plenty of opportunities to study and to teach the magnificent word of God. And do you know, you know, you know what? I'll just say this. I am certain that Jesus is the saviour. I am certain that Jesus is the son of God. I am certain that Jesus is the Messiah who saves the world. And I'm certain for many, many reasons, lots of different reasons. But one of the reasons I'm certain is because every day I'm opening up the Old Testament and I'm seeing new ways in which the Old Testament points beautifully and poetically and gloriously to Christ. I re- my job is a huge privilege to read the Old Testament and see how God, the Holy Spirit, has authored Scripture in such a way that it points beautifully to Christ over and over. I know that Matthew, the tax collector, and John, the fisherman, and the other gospel writers were not clever enough to invent this story and to, to almost without knowing, allude to the Old Testament so often over and over again. When I read this book, I can just tell that despite the fact it's had so many different human authors, God has knitted this together beautifully. Reading the Old Testament and seeing how the New Testament links to it grows my faith. I'm certain that Jesus is our saviour. And this is one of the reasons why the way that Elisha's story points to Christ's story and the way that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Oh, to spend days reading the Old Testament and seeing Christ on page after page. I want to encourage you to be a reader of the Old Testament and to see Jesus in the Old Testament. And, and as you do that, for the Holy Spirit to move so that your faith, faith levels rise and rise and rise and rise. I just can't help it. The, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the way they're knitted together, is just so gloriously and divinely beautiful. So that's the first reason why Jesus being the greater Elisha is significant, because it teaches us how to read the Old Testament. But secondly, and more importantly, consider Elisha's name. Elisha means, in Hebrew, my God is salvation. Now compare that to Jesus' name, Joshua or Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation salvation. When we say that Jesus is the greater Elisha or the true Elisha, what we're saying is that Jesus is God's salvation. He is the way of salvation. He is the revelation of the way to be saved. Jesus shows that Yahweh is salvation. Jesus shows that our God is salvation. That's what we say. When we say Jesus is the true Elisha, the the greater Elisha, we're saying Jesus is the true and greater way of receiving salvation. And this is, of course, the story of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all tell the same story, that Jesus saves us through his life and death and resurrection from the dead. All who believe in Jesus, all who put their faith in him, receive forgiveness and eternal life. They are rescued from sin and from death into an eternal life. They will enter into the new heavens and the new earth. They have a relationship with God that will last forever and ever. They are saved from everything evil into this goodness of eternity, into paradise forever and ever. Jesus is the salvation of God. Jesus is the greater Elisha. Elisha's name just testified to the salvation that would come in and through Jesus Christ. And so the feeding of the 5,000 reveals that Jesus is the greater Elisha and reveals that Jesus is salvation. Put your faith in him today and be saved from sin and death, from guilt and shame. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is our compassionate king. 
He's the greater Elisha, the one who saves. Thirdly, Jesus is God who feeds his people. There is, of course, another Old Testament allusion here in the feeding of the 5,000 story. It's an allusion to the book of Exodus. In Exodus, the people of Israel are saved out of slavery in Egypt, and they enter into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, the people get hungry, and they moan about their lack of food. But God provides this amazing miracle of manna falling from heaven. Every day, new manna, which is bread, would, would fall from heaven and, and just fall flood the floor and the Israelites would go out and collect all this bread and they would be satisfied and there'd be manna left over and then the next day the same thing would happen again over and over God would always provide for them well here we have a story where Israelites enter the wilderness they follow Jesus out into the wilderness and God feeds them Jesus who is God gives them the bread that they need when they're hungry. Now you could say from this that Jesus is the greater Moses. Jesus is the new Moses. Just as Moses led the Israelites into the wilderness, so Jesus in a sense leads the Israelites out into a wilderness in Matthew 14 and feeds them. But I think the message is stronger and greater than that. This is really a message that reveals Jesus as God. The manna fell from heaven as a sure sign that it was God who was providing this food. Here, though, the food comes from the hands of Jesus. He blesses the food. He breaks the food. He gives the food to the disciples. And then as the disciples circulate the food, there's more and more food until there's 12 baskets full left over. And so just as manna fell from heaven, here food comes from the hands of Jesus. And so I think it would be to say, less of Christ than we should to say he's simply the new Moses. We say here he is God who feeds hungry Israelites. It is significant that there are 12 baskets left over at the end, representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in a sense, what this miracle is saying is that, yes, Jesus has fed 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus the women, plus the children. He's fed thousands of people. You know, I don't know how many people that would actually be. It's more than 5,000, whether it be, you know, 12, 13, 14,000. Depends how many kids and how many women there are. He's fed thousands and thousands of people. But in reality, Jesus has the power to feed the whole nation of Israel, all 12 tribes. These 12 baskets full left over are representative of how Jesus could feed the whole nation nation of Israel. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but in chapter 15, there's what seems like a lesser miracle. Jesus feeds 4,000 people and there are seven baskets full left over. So I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but if you want to reflect on that, in a few weeks time we'll preach on that passage, think about what the seven baskets left over might mean, the significance of the number of seven. If 12 baskets represent the 12 tribes of Israel, what do seven baskets mean? But I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Instead, I want us to dwell and reflect on Jesus Christ, who is revealed as the God who feeds hungry Israelites and the God who provides for his people. He's the compassionate God, but his compassion is not without power. He has the power to also feed and look after those who need him. He heals the sick. He feeds the hungry. He provides for his people. And he is mighty to feed and provide for the whole nation of Israel. Fourthly, and finally today, we must understand this miracle is not just about Jesus physically feeding people. There is a spiritual significance to this miracle as well. And we must say this, this miracle is not just about pointing to the Old Testament, backwards to the Old Testament. No, this miracle also points forward to Jesus' death and the institution of communion, the Lord's Supper. If you read John's Gospel, John tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000. 
And after that miracle, and after Jesus walks on water, Jesus preaches a sermon. And the sermon, in that sermon, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he explicitly connects the feeding of the 5,000 with the communion that we take as Christians. Now, Matthew doesn't record that teaching. Matthew doesn't record that sermon. He decides to leave it out. Rather, Matthew asks his readers to do a little bit of legwork. Matthew wants his readers to meditate on the text of his gospel, to reflect on what the Holy Spirit is saying in his words. And when a person does that, they see clear similarities between Matthew 14 and this miracle and Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. In fact, let's, let's read those verses together. Matthew 26. I wasn't planning on doing this, but let's, let's go there. Let's go to Matthew 26 and just read those verses, because um, it's always good to read as much of God's word as you possibly can. So this is Matthew 26, verses um, 26 to 29. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. In both passages, in the feeding of the 5,000 and in the institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus takes bread. In both passages, he breaks that bread. And in both passages, he gives the bread to his disciples. There are other linguistic similarities between those two passages as well. Both passages use the word all on a couple of occasions. The discerning reader connects the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 with the institution of the Lord's Supper and knows that the breaking of bread in communion is symbolic of Jesus giving up and breaking his body upon the cross. The implication is this. You cannot understand the feeding of the 5,000 without thinking of Jesus's death. Just as the breaking of bread satisfied hungry Israelites, so Jesus' death, the breaking of his body, satisfies hungry souls. For all who believe in Jesus' death, all who metaphorically receive the bread of Jesus' body by faith, receive forgiveness and enter into a relationship with God. And that relationship with God is all we need. It is to know God and to be in relationship with God. To have Christ is enough for true satisfaction. Sometimes it feels like we need more than that, doesn't it? But the truth is, if you have God, you have everything you need. For he is the creator God who, who from that relationship, from that place, gives us everything we need. If you are a Christian, you do not lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Because Jesus is my shepherd, I don't need, I don't want anything more. To have Jesus is to have everything. And so the death of Jesus satisfies souls, just as the breaking of bread at the feeding of the 5,000 satisfies the hungry. Just as breaking of bread here in Matthew 14 gives life and energy to weary people, so Jesus' death and the breaking of his body gives eternal life to those who need rest, who receive Jesus' body by faith. Do you see how this miracle, yes, it feeds people physically, but it has spiritual significance in the way it points to Jesus' body being broken upon the cross. In other words, the feeding of the 5,000 doesn't just point back to the Old Testament revealing Jesus' identity. It also points forward and shows that Jesus is the one who will provide all we need by breaking his body upon the cross. 
the death of Christ upon the cross is perhaps the greater miracle. For in in Matthew 14, Jesus feeds 5,000 men and some women and some children. But at the end of Matthew's gospel, he gives up his life upon the cross. He dies. The miracle is that he's a God of such compassion that he breaks his body willingly for us in order to provide spiritual satisfaction and all we need. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that glorious? We have such a loving saviour. You know, to to heal the sick was an amazing um, um, declaration of Jesus' compassion. But to die on the cross was the supreme declaration, the supreme showing of just how compassionate and loving he really is. To feed 5,000 people was amazing, but to die for the sins of the world, to give to them, to satisfy them, to bring them into spiritual union with God the Father, that was a greater miracle. That was a more glorious moment. The feeding of the 5,000 should draw our eyes through communion to the cross of Christ in such a way that our hearts are moved to worship Jesus. It wasn't simply the breaking of bread that supplied what the people needed. It was the breaking of his body upon the cross. I want you to know this. Jesus is a compassionate king. He loves you so much. He died for you on the cross. If you are a Christian, you have already received the forgiveness and the eternal life that Jesus won for you. But if you are not a Christian, you are rejecting the compassion of Jesus. And you need to receive it. You need to believe in Christ. You need to believe that he loved you so much he died for you to believe in Christ, to receive by faith his body and to rejoice at the forgiveness and everlasting life which is given to you, the way he supplies for your every need, the way he satisfies you with himself. For the one who has God, the one who has been restored into relationship with God the Father, has everything he or she needs. And so as I draw to a close, let me remind you of what we've seen this morning. Four challenges. To leave behind what is comfortable. To follow Christ, even into the desolate places. To feed those who are hungry, as Jesus' disciples should. To bring what we have, rather than focus on what we don't have. To bless our food and thank God for his provision. Those four challenges come from this text, but more importantly, we have four revelations of who Jesus is. He is our compassionate king. He is the greater Elisha, the God of salvation. And he is the God who provides food in the wilderness, who feeds the hungry, who looks after his people. And fourthly and finally and ultimately, he is the one who provides most spectacularly by breaking his body upon the cross for dying for the sins of the world. What a glorious saviour we have in Christ. A compassionate king, a God of salvation, a God of provision, and a God who, in a costly way, gives up his life to save us. Let's end this service in prayer. It would be wonderful if we were meeting in person to break bread together, to remind ourselves that we are all one body because we share in one bread, to drink the wine and remember Jesus' blood that was shed. We can't do that. We, in a few weeks' time when we are able to gather, we will celebrate communion together and I can't wait for that. But today, let's just remember Jesus' death as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. He is the compassionate King. He is the God of salvation, the greater Elisha. He is the God who provides, who feeds hungry Israelites in the wilderness. And he is the one who gave up his body upon the cross that we might be forgiven. Lord, we are in awe of our glorious Saviour, Jesus. We are filled with thanksgiving. We worship you, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise for the salvation that you want for us. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you for the gift of yourself. You are with us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We have you, and when we have you, we need nothing else. You are the God who satisfies. You are more than enough. There is God left over for us. When we've had all that we need, there's still much of God to discover and rejoice and enjoy 
joy. And so we thank you for the feeding of the 5,000, which was an amazing miracle in and of itself. But we thank you for how it points to the cross and reveals the greater miracle, the greater sacrifice, the greater provision, the spiritual provision of Jesus dying in our place. And so we ask that we would also respond to these challenges. We pray that we would leave behind what is comfortable. We pray that we would be Christians who feed those who are hungry. We pray that we would bring what we have rather than focus on what we don't have. And we pray that when we receive food, when we eat, we would bring thanksgiving and blessing to you. That we would appreciate that you are God who gives good, good gifts to us, including all we eat. We thank you, Heavenly Father for this amazing miracle, this amazing story. I pray we would rejoice in the truth and live out the challenges. For your glory we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.